Jesus say, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Good morning, viewers. Welcome to your favorite program, The Bible Speaks. My name is Prince. Today, Pastor Mflang is going to talk about the horse power legend. To hear more about the horse, sit back and relax. But before he continues, we are going to listen to a piece of music. Be blessed. See <laughs> Greetings to you, viewers, in the name of the Lord. Amen. It is a great honor for me to be featuring before you today with regards to matters that pertain to the name of the Lord. Amen. This morning, we are looking at a very, very important subject. The subject of power in religion. Let me say to you, nothing is as nauseating to God as a religion devoid of power. There is nothing 
is unwelcome before the Lord as a religion of profession without the accompanying power of the Spirit of God. It is on account of this that this morning I have decided to entitle our sermon as horsepower religion. Yes. Why horsepower religion? Because God has decided to speak to us through nature. Yes. God has various ways of communicating his will to us. Yes. Actually, one writer says, nature and revelation alike testify of God's love. Yes. And so this morning, we begin by turning to the book of Romans chapter 1, and we are going to be reading verses 18 to 20. This is what the great apostle Paul says. He says, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and the wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. And then verse 19 says, since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse. What we find here is the Apostle Paul stressing the point that creation testifies to the power and creative works of God. As you look around creation, creation is supposed to communicate the message that says to you, God is love. So this morning we have decided to take one of the animals which was created by God and out of it find lessons that lead us to a deeper knowledge of God. That's why we have entitled our sermon this morning, Horsepower Religion. Because the animal we are going to study this morning is the horse itself. This is what is said about horses. There are 150 breeds of non-horses today. Some breeds are large, while other breeds are small. The smallest horse being the Argentinian horse, which is only 30 inches high. And the largest horse is estimated to be 68 inches high and weighs about 910 kgs. Horses, as we know them, are high-speed animals. The fastest horse goes at the speed of 84 kilometers per hour. And for thousands of years, the horse has been one of the most useful animals to human beings. They provided the fastest and safest way to travel on land. They were also used by soldiers. But of course, today, the horse has been replaced by the train, the automobile, and many other modes of transportation. But today, we still want to learn out of this animal something about the character of our God. The first lesson that we find from the horse 
has to do with its relationship to its owner. What we understand about the horse is that it is eager to please their owner, to please its owner or its trainer. That's one of the characteristics of the horse. Most horses have good memory and they can easily be trained to obey commands. A circus horse, for instance, bows when its trainee touches its front legs with a whip. Horses can learn to respond to the slightest of signals. The horse moves forward when the rider's legs are placed slightly against the horse's side. It turns at a slight pull of the reins against its neck. The quick obedience of the horse has made it one of the most valuable animals. So what is the lesson for us today as sons and daughters of God? The respect and honor of the horse for its master says to us as God's children, we need to both seek and to honor our God. The psalmist in Psalm 111 verse 10 has this to say, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding of all those who do his commandments. Horsepower religion is linked up to obedient Christianity. True Christianity is obedient to the will of God. Solomon, the wise man, wrote and said in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13, Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Amen. The word of God emphasizes what our duties are. It is now up to us to learn from the horse how it works with its master. The horse will respond at the slightest signal. What we find here, the Lord has already sent his signal. He says to you as his child, he says to you as his daughter, turn to me and be obedient in your ways. Using an example from the military, Realm, the Apostle Paul says, no one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer. Yes. Anyone who is a soldier learns to take orders. This is one thing good about the military. People know protocol. They know who to salute and who not to salute. Anyone who is a soldier, when he is in parade, he has nothing to do with civilian affairs. People may be laughing, getting entertainment from somewhere, but for the soldier, the greatest sound is the voice of the commanding officer. What are we saying today? The world is running amok after many things. But to you and to me as a Christian, we need to listen to the voice of our commanding officer, Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus is our commanding officer. Many voices are clamoring for attention. The media is clamoring for attention. There are many voices that are hanging in the air. But for you and me, there is only one voice that counts, the commanding officer's voice. That's the voice of Jesus. So I invite you today, brothers and sisters, to take heed. I like to ask you the question, who is your commanding officer? I like to say to all of you that name, the name of Jesus. You better respond to the commanding officer and obey his commands. Because every Christian is a soldier, 
We remember the song that says, We are soldiers in the army. Although we might have to die, but why should you die if you are not obeying the commanding officer? Jesus himself said in John chapter 15 verse 10, If you love me, keep my commandments. The word of God is made plain. The Bible speaks eloquently for itself. It puts matters very clearly to us. So that when we make our choices, we make our choices intelligently. The word of God says, if you love me, keep my commandments. There is a story that is told. This one comes from the seminary context where theologians do their studies. This theologian is said to have been now in the third and final year. And now he came to the final examination after studying courses like eschatology, Christology, and other courses. Time has come now to come and write his final examination and graduate and go out to minister to the world. So as he came into the examination room, he finds the question paper before him. And what is written on the question paper, they, there were only two questions. The first question says, write everything that you know about Jesus. And plan to spend one and a half hours on this question. And the second question says, write everything you know about Satan. And plan to spend one and a half hours on this question. Because the examination was going to be three hours. So the theologian entered into the examination room. He looked at question one and he started writing about Jesus. The half hour came, he was still writing about Jesus. Finally the full hour came, he was not exhausted in writing about Jesus. One and a half hours are gone. He is writing about Jesus. Now he is coming to a time when he was about to overlap and go into the second half. What shall he do now? This theologian says, I must write more about Jesus. One hour, 40 minutes is writing about Jesus. And then two hours came and he's still writing about Jesus. Then two hours, 30 minutes, he's still writing about Jesus. Finally, it was three hours and 59 minutes. Just about the time the invigilator says, wind up, it's almost the time that you now stop writing. But then the invigilator comes and says, it appears you've answered one question, what about this one? Then right on the stroke of three hours, he turns to the last question and he says, no time for the devil. We are saying to you, brothers and sisters, if we believe in Jesus, let's live with our eyes focused on Jesus. He is the one who has brought us into existence. The Apostle Paul says, Jesus is the beginner and finisher of our faith. There is nothing to gain by learning more and more about the devil. Because he's a rascal. Someone has actually says he's now a toothless bulldog. There is more and more that we gain by learning more and more about the commanding officer. Whose power religion is not about horses. Whose power religion is about listening and surrendering to the men of Calvary. Whose power religion is about surrendering all to Jesus. 
we must be able to sing and say all to Jesus I surrender. Amen. All to him I freely give him. We must be able to sing and say we are marching to Zion the beautiful city of our God. Oh yes we are marching there. I'm inviting you to march with me to Jerusalem, the beautiful city of our God. Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? There was a time during his trial before Pilate when he was bruised and battered, Pilate could only say, Behold the man. He is the man of Calvary. He is the savior of humanity. <laughs> oh yes, Jesus is the rose of Sharon and the lily by the valley. That is the one that I'm inviting you to follow today. This is the man. Horse power religion. The second lesson that we need to learn from the horse comes from the horse, especially its dietary habits. Horses are known to be temperate animals. Horses are said to have strong teeth that can grind anything from animal products to plant life. But nevertheless, we are told, horses, horses will eat grass and grass alone. They will never actually stray from their diet. Thus, like the horse. What lesson do we learn from this characteristic of the horse? It has been said, he who conquers, he who controls himself is greater than he who conquers a city. Oh yes, my brothers and sisters, the highest evidence of nobility in a man or woman is self-control. It has been said, when you accept Jesus, Jesus will do something in your life which you can never do for yourself. Oh, yes. This is what Jesus does. He will turn an ordinary woman into a lady. Jesus turns an ordinary man into a gentleman. I was saying the other time this man was a drunkard finally he found Jesus and then one day he confronts old friends who were atheists and agnostics you see atheists say there is no God agnostics say we do not know whether he is there or not but the bottom line is they have no faith in God both of them have no faith in God. So they met with his old friends. And the friends come to him and say, My friend, you believing in Jesus. Why now believe in Jesus? Do you truly believe in the stories told in the Gospels? Do you think that it actually happened that Jesus walked on water? Are you aware of the laws of physics and chemistry of the water? Something must have gone wrong with you. Why don't you come back and we go to our games of the past? Can you prove that Jesus is actually there? And the gentleman answered and said, My friends, I cannot share much with you. But this is what I have to say to you. Before I knew Jesus, my children were afraid of me. Now they love me. Before I knew Jesus, I had nothing with my, my wife. But now my wife is the dearest of friends. Therefore, whether you believe or not that Jesus exists, but he has done something for me. Amen. Jesus is powerful, my friends. Yes. He who controls himself is greater than he who conquers a city. Unfortunately, my brothers and sisters, this is the area where our generation falls short. This is where we fall short, my brothers and sisters. It is a generation under the grip of what have been termed the six modern sins. 
six modern sins. The first of the modern sins is pleasure without conscience. People all say, my flesh desires for it, therefore I will have it. Pleasures which say, whether it is God ordained or not God ordained, I like it, therefore I do it. Think of homosexuality, think of lesbianism. These scenes of the last days. I'm not saying pleasure on its own is evil. We ought to rejoice, but we must remember there are boundaries. Amen. We must know the boundaries that exist. God is saying, this is so, where you may go, this is where you may never go. We are a generation that ignores the boundaries of God. So we have abnormal human beings. You find one man saying to another man, my sweetheart. <laughs> you find one woman saying to another woman, you are my beautiful wife. A generation that has twisted priorities. This is the generation, pleasures without a conscience. Wealth without work is the second one. We have people who want to get rich and get rich quickly. You say, my friend, but where did you get millions and millions in a short time? But they were seated at home. Wealth without work. Actually, our generation has been known to be a lazy generation. A generation where children were told to work, they say, I spent the whole day suffering today because I was digging in the garden. They want to eat well, good at choosing the right kind of foods, but not eager to work. We also have the problem of the third sin, knowledge without character. We have giants of intellectual gymnastics. You reason with them this way, they go this way. When you're about to agree with him, he turns around and goes that way. <laughs> Giants in intellectual gymnastics, but nevertheless spiritual dwarfs. People with no character. Intelligent upstairs, but empty on the inside. This is the generation we are living in. We also have the problem of uh, industry without morality. <laughs> have you ever seen a time, the times in which we live, where you find things like prostitution? What is it called? These people are now called commercial sex workers. Industry without morality. <laughs> this is where we are today. Have you not seen it on television where this woman is told, but don't you know the days are evil? You are going to be contaminated with the disease. This woman says, it is better to be for me to die of AIDS than to die of hunger. Industry without morality. Then science without humanity is the next one. The DVDs are there. The computers are there. The internet is there. We are now a global village, but we're a global village with human beings without humanity. 